Well, thanks for joining us this afternoon. I'm uh, Malcolm Dixon. I'm the director of Street Level Photo Works. And uh, we're joined today by Alicia Farnan and Peter Ian Campbell uh, for today's In Focus uh, chat and presentation. The format of this is that each of the artists will talk for a chat for about 20 minutes and show lots of images. We'll have time at the end of each of the photographer's contributions for uh, questions that have come through from, from the audience. And welcome to all of the audience today. Um, then at the end, we'll, we'll open it out again if there's any further, further questions. In all, it will last about uh, one hour. Now, the context for uh, today's talks um, are the fact that there's two new publications just being produced on uh, two respective bodies of work by Ian and Alicia. Ask the Sea by Peter Ian Campbell known to all of us as Ian, that's the format of that, and this, which is organised recreation by Alicia. Lovely production these are, and they are described as, uh, as, as a new series of affordable zines, which uh, showcase projects that explore our relationship to place. There's about 32 pages, both same format, I think there's been seven produced so far, um, but 32 pages, staple bound, they're all in a limited edition of 100, so very rare items indeed. It's produced by another place press and their imprint, which is called Field Notes. And as I say, I think there's been seven in that, in that production. It's quite interesting because they are described as photozines and um, there's a bit of a grey area between what is a zine and what is a photo book, because um, as I say, these, uh, this has a quite a high kind of production standard that would certainly place it within the realm of, of the book. But that's, that's another matter and that's a, a different discussion. So um, we're going to start off with, uh, with Ian, and I think uh, Alicia will We'll go into the background at this point. And so we'll just kick off with, with uh, you, Ian. You're based in Glasgow. You graduated from Napier in 2001. You describe your practice um, as split between your own personal projects and commercial work uh, or commercial assignments. And I think within the commercial assignments, we could include certain community-based work as well that you've... Uh, uh, you undertake. You're also a teacher at City of Glasgow College. So I hope some of your students are uh, sitting in on this today. Okay. Um, two of your works were included in the street level open late last year. Uh, and one of the images uh, from Ask the Sea was also included in the, uh, the Scottish Portrait Awards uh, also in 2019. Uh, so that was quite interesting to see. So it's all very timely, this publication coming out at this time and profiling this very interesting uh, body of work. Mm -hmm. So let's kind of start at the beginning with yourself, Ian, and tell us what your work is about and what has led you to this uh, serious Ask the Sea. Yeah, sure. Um, good afternoon, Malcolm. Afternoon, everyone that's joining us today. So. Um, I think uh, yeah, it was the, the idea came to me to explore doing a, a sort of documentary project in the North Sea in around about autumn 2013. So I had been working freelance um, for about 12 years up until that point, um, keeping trying to keep busy, moving from one branch of the industry to another to keep things interesting. But I was fairly frustrated at the lack of opportunity to develop projects, uh, personal projects um, that can often be a sort of byproduct of, of working freelance. So, um, and around about 2013, I became fairly sort of disillusioned with what I was working on because I was spending far too much time 
sitting in front of a computer processing images and not enough time sort of working on projects. So I'd always had uh, an interest in uh, exploring forms of heavy industry. So often sort of wrestling with how photography can be used to sort of connect our industrial past to the present and also looking at um, environments that are where the, the, the people that worked in these industries had been removed in the machinery and how they transition, how they sort of metamorphose into a different landscape and who starts occupying those spaces. So, uh, so there was always an interest there. And I think I decided that um, the offshore oil and gas industry was an area that hadn't really been explored photographically before. And um, that's when I decided, right, okay, I need to try and find a way in which I can do a, a large scale project because I felt there was something there. Um, and um, so, yeah, so that kind of started a whole sort of um, number of kind of processes to try and get involved in that. Um, it's probably worthwhile me sort of sharing my screen now. At this Please stage do. Of my Please do. Yes. So. Can you see that okay, yeah? Yes. So, so basically I decided, right, I, I really wanted to go out and, and, uh, and work on this project. So, but I knew there was not gonna be any opportunity for me to just contact a number of operators and ask them to sort of, you know, allow me to go out and, and uh, work on this project. Um, it costs thousands of pounds to, to fly someone out on a helicopter. Um, to, to go out there. And I certainly wasn't wanting to do a project that was going to be more sort of corporate based. So I felt that the, the best thing for me was to try and um, work there. And in a sense, this sort of, I was quite comfortable with this because I thought, well, I needed something that was the antithesis of what I've been doing up to that point. And I thought, well, this will be a really interesting experience. I'll need to try and um, you know get 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 a, a, a job out there. So I went up to Aberdeen. I spent uh, spent a week um, doing uh, um, the sort of offshore safety and in induction sort of training, and I spent about eight months contacting uh, you know drilling contractors, agencies. Um, to try and see if there was any opportunity to, to get a job. So the, it, it took about eight months until I got a break. Um, and that was fine. I was still working as a photographer at the time. And that's when, um, when I managed to sort of secure a core crew job on a drilling rig. So um, I'm just showing this, uh, this picture here. So this is part of the, the Ask the Sea project. And I'll, I'll talk about how I approached shooting these installations in, in five minutes or so. But what was interesting about this was, this is actually the location where I worked for two years. So this is in the central North Sea, about 130 miles east of Aberdeen. And it wasn't on this drilling rig, but it was a drilling rig very similar in construction to this. But I spent a fair bit of time roaming around this little sort of um, 40, um, um, Franklin platform here um, so that was the sort of location for uh, for where I worked and just to, to give people just an idea of the, the the geography of the North Sea so essentially if you if you travel um, about 200 miles due east of Edinburgh and um, there's a, um, there's a, a East producer FPSO which is a floating production storage and offloading uh, vessel and that's probably the most southern sort of platform, production platform in the Scottish sector of the North Sea. And you can go as sort of far north to the, the Magnus Field, which, um, which is about 355 miles northeast of, of Aberdeen. So again, to give people a sense of the kind of scale of the, the UK continental shelf as, 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 as it would be classed, um, there is, um, you know, that a journey that far from, from Aberdeen by boat um, would, would take about 28 to 30 hours. So quite a long way. And there's, there's uh, um, the North Sea median line that, that splits the UK waters from the Norwegian waters. And, and that's about 200, meet, uh, 200 miles east of, east of Aberdeen. So just gives you a sort of sense of the, of the scope really of the, of the North Sea. 
just to clarify, though, Ian, this was a, a self-initiated project. It was not an assignment you were given at any point. Yeah. No, absolutely. So, so essentially, I was working. Uh, I had a. Uh, I, I was um, working as a steward when I was out there. So, um, so essentially, that's um, housekeeping. So, um, it's. I, I had. Uh, I was working three weeks on, three weeks off. Um, and that was a, a twelve-hour shift on and twelve off. So, so it was great because I was on my feet a lot of the time. I got to know the crew. I was getting paid as I would as a steward. So I was getting paid to to do my job to work there. And in a way, it was. I was kind of hoping that um, by being there, by working there, by connecting with people, getting to know people, befriending people. I would get that opportunity to eventually try and um, bring my, my camera gear out and start doing this project, which is which is what happened. But I had to essentially bed myself in for for about five months, um, just working there. Didn't mention to anyone about the fact I was a photographer on the outside. And then I, uh, after about five months, I approached the um, the rig manager and I said, "Look." I'm a photographer. Do you mind if I start bringing my, my uh, gear out and start shooting seascapes? So that was the starting point for, for the project. Essentially, he was comfortable about, about that. And um, so this became the sort of first aspect. This sort of was allowing me to kind of break into doing, doing the work. Um, I shot on film um, and I had a number of reasons for doing this, but part of it was because it was all mechanical. Um, so I didn't have to get a permit to work every time I wanted to go out. So, um, and I was just either doing this, um, if I was working a night shift, I would be having a break in the middle of the night and I would go out and try and do some, uh, some work there. Or, during the day, I would just maybe try and get shots first thing in the morning or, or, or later in the, in, in the evening. So, um, so this became something that was really quite important to me in terms of um, the development of this project. So I was, um, I was really sort of fascinated by how this sort of environment completely swallowed up these installations. Um, but it was also a means for me to escape the sort of um, the interior rumblings of the rig as well. So there was this kind of spiritual um, sort of um, attachment to doing these kind of seascapes. Yeah, okay. You have mentioned, uh, I read an interview that you was undertaken with you on the, the platform, uh, Photofilmic. Yes, that's right, that's right. Is a very interesting uh, website and journal indeed. And you talk about working in film as being part photography and part meditation. <laughs> Is there anything else you'd like to kind of add to that about the, the nature of, of um, film and, and the mechanical? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 don't get me wrong, I love digital as well. Um, and uh, it, it, with the Ask the Sea project, I mean, there's certainly been times when I've had to shoot digital, particularly when I'm, I'm shooting very late at night, at very low light, so, so digital is ideal for that. But I mean, I think this, I think it was um, um, the, uh, Roger Ballen talked about the kind of alchemy of film and I really sort of, I really connect with that, the, the, the the way that this that sort of chemistry kind of renders color and light, um, and I and and for me as well, I like the waiting game with film. So um, whereas digital is great and it's instant, and particularly when you're working commercially, and I think that was the other thing for me as well. This was a sort of maybe a reaction to having spent quite a number of years just shooting digitally for for a number of jobs. So. Uh, I, I love the waiting game. So I'd be, go, I'd be out on the, on the rig for three weeks and not knowing what my results were like. I mean, I would take snaps on my phone just to get the kind of colors and stuff, but, um, but I love that sort of process, the slowing down of it. And, and I think that's the thing I often sort of mention to my students is that, you know, when you're shooting in film, you're kind of forced to really think about what you're shooting because it costs money. So it's like, and, and, I, and I do like that part of it and, and that works for me as well. So, and, and, and that's how I'd certainly like to approach the, the personal projects. 
Yeah, okay. The precursor to Ask the Sea is Starlings on Fire. Yeah. There might be a continuum between Starlings on Fire and Ask the Sea. Is that, is that the case? Yeah, that's that's absolutely right. So, I mean, Starlings on Fire was was certainly the the, the first project that um, was was solely sort of located on this on this drilling rig that I, I worked on, and um, and in a way that allowed me the work that I did on the on the rig really allowed me to then contact the the operators a couple of years later when I was no longer working offshore and showed them the work that I had produced and said, look, I have an idea now for a much bigger project. Um, uh, you know, would you be, you know, would you be able to sort of support me just in terms of allowing me to, to have access on other, um, on other supply vessels. So, so it certainly helped. It, it wasn't, it didn't feel complete in any way, because of course the two years that I was working on this project, I had to, I had to work on it solely when I had the time when I wasn't actually doing my job. So, um, but, um, but one of the things interestingly that I had been planning to do earlier this year, around about Easter time, I was just in um, contact with, with one of the operators um, that had been on their, their vessels uh, to shoot their installations. Um, and I'd been in touch with them just about trying to, uh, to go back out onto the installations as a photographer, purely to just sort of develop the work that I'd originally started in Starlings on Fire. So there's certainly a connected body of work. Yeah, okay. Now, I don't know how many images you have here lined up, uh, Ian, but maybe you just want to run through uh, and give us some commentary where relevant on them, please, yeah? Yeah, absolutely. So obviously on the back of just the... Um, the, the seascape work that I'd done, I then got the opportunity to 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 really um, go wherever I wanted on the rig. They were really, as long as I was doing my job, they were happy for me to, um, you know, to 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 do to to go anywhere. And of course, I knew everyone by this stage, and um, so there wasn't really uh, there wasn't really an issue. Um, they quite liked the idea that I was I was there uh, photographing because, of course, it's completely. It's, it's just not something that's allowed out there. So, and this was quite an interesting one. I, so I was very much drawn to the, uh, to the drill floor. Uh, it's the fulcrum for the drilling rig. It's the, whole, the, it's the whole reason why a drilling rig would be there in the first place. So, and I love this kind of convergence of this old industry, old traditional industry, but this kind of modern um, technological sort of industry as well. So you have, in some ways, I quite you know I'm, I'm very interested in photography. Early how early photography was used to sort of document sort of construction of heavy industry, um, and uh, I sort of feel as part of this image could also could almost be from the sort of early 1900s. Yet in the doghouse, which is this area here, you have a driller, an assistant driller, who are sitting on these sort of leather seats like the. Um, like the deck of the enterprise with joystick controllers controlling all this incredible sort of machinery. So something quite sort of dark and post-apocalyptic about this as well, but it was really, really fascinating. So, so, um, so moving on to, from Starlings and Fire. So essentially what, what happened was that um, the, the oil, um, the oil pr price collapsed um, during the time uh, that I was working offshore. So there was a lot of really interesting things that were happening to the industry during the time that I was working offshore. Um, a lot, there was a lot of talk about the, how the um, income that was going to be generated from the oil and gas industry in the Scottish sector of the North Sea could be used to, um, as a guide for how much money the Scotland were going to generate as an independent nation. Um, and at that time, when I first went off, a, a barrel of oil was about $100, $110 a barrel. And again, just to give people a kind of idea, uh, a barrel would be 158 litres in a barrel. But the, the price of oil had collapsed quite significantly to the extent that a lot of the people that I worked with um, offshore were made redundant. The contract that the drilling rig I was on came to an end with the operator. Um, and so I ended up um, 
just ad, ad hoc. So moving around the North Sea, working on different platforms for a year, doing very little photography, but it became really interesting and in that allowed me to, to consider how the project could be developed further. And that's when I, I, I took the opportunity to start making those contacts with, um, with a number of the operators to sort of talk about this documentary project, which became Ask the Sea essentially, where um, I would go out and start creating this kind of documentary of all the remaining um, uh, drilling rigs and production platforms across the Scottish sector of the North Sea. So one, one thing that I should say, which is what um, Ascacy was, is, is for me, it's, um, it's quite different from, um, from the uh, Starlings on Fire in the sense that my intention was to allow this work to have real breathing space and, a, and room for contemplation. Because for me, one of the great strengths of photography is the fact that um, it's what it suggests more than what it says. And uh, I, lo I love the fact that um, it's open to interpretation. So for example, an image like this, to one person, they could be looking at this thinking, well, this is this provocative totem of an industry that is heavily linked with climate change and global warming. And you can't argue with that. And, and, um, but to another viewer, this could be, um, you know, the, the construction of, of this industry um, and these installations in, in the 70s was an incredible feat of engineering. I mean, unbelievable. I mean, we, the, the, at that time, there was quite a lot of links between what was happening with NASA trying to send, you know, astronauts to the moon and actually at the same time, engineers trying to use similar sort of ideas and developments and in, in engineering to try and create these kind of movable sort of structures and try and um, uh, find, out, find a way of being able to extract oil in this kind of pretty wild environment. So I really like that sort of conflict between the two. Um, one thing that is, is absolutely certain is that what happened um, in the North Sea with the development of this industry completely and utterly transformed the UK's economy. I mean, there's no, that's, that you cannot be argued. I mean, it's it utterly transformed the economy um, over the, sort of, the years since. So, so it's really interesting, this idea of when I try and, and, and allow this kind of work to kind of have breathing space. So it's kind of open to that interpretation of, if that kind of makes sense, Malcolm. That makes sense, yes. It's also quite politically loaded. That's perhaps a different conversation, you know, at the time it of is. the 70s. And, yeah, you know, yeah. whose oil is it? Is it Scotland's or is it the America's Absolutely. or the UK's? But it's a, a very um, uh, loaded uh, subject area. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, so in a way, so this, I, so I tried to obviously from, from a photographic point of view, I, I you know, I, again, I, I, it was important for me to um, to shoot this this um, these these installations from the same perspective. So there is a, a, an exclusion zone around installations which are about five hundred meters. And you can't go within that unless you're allowed, um, unless the operator of the installation allows that. So I always shot these round about sort of 400 meters from the installations. And I just, I, I really wanted to keep that kind of consistency, the consistency of lighting as well throughout this. And sometimes I was really unlucky. Sometimes the, the weather would be glorious and it, but it, and it just wasn't, it, it wouldn't, I, I couldn't use the images, which was a shame, but that was just kind of part of the process, thankfully. It is the North Sea, so most of the time it is sort of overcast. So, so this has become a bit of an obsession, really, in terms of how I'm trying to kind of chart this, um, because I'm thinking of this in terms of you know how this industry will um, develop in the years ahead, or and you know changes that are taking place even now. So, um, so this is very much a sort of ongoing project. Um, I'm still. I'm probably only, I would say, about a third of my way through this. Okay. So there's just a few there, just in ten, terms of the sense of sort of typology. It's very much like, as I sort of mentioned um, on the um, 
with Ask the Sea on the, on the text about um, very much inspired by the sort of what the Beckers had done. Yeah. Um, and again, so I think this this image was used last year in the, the, the street level open. So I, I think what was what I liked about this image as well is again this sort of sense of how this sort of connects with a completely different. It's a completely different pace of uh, of uh, of life when you're out in the supply vessels. There's something very hypnotic about it. And usually when I go on there, I'm, I'm going on there solely as a photographer. I can I can position myself up in the up in the bridge. There's a 360 degree view, and it's just there's this sort of and I tend to do this specifically in mainly in the summer because it's a lot calmer it's easier to shoot it's longer days and um there's just a kind of really nice sort of pace to um to, to sort of um working there and I, I love that sort of constant kind of move movement with the swell and i've got a lot of time to move around and um and and connect with the crew and find look for what I think are going to be interesting sort of portraits to make, um, and sometimes it's just very surreal. I mean, I I was sort of up on the bridge. We were heading up to the northern North Sea to the where the Beryl Bravo is, um, and I, I was on the bridge and I heard sort of a basketball and um, uh, seemingly it's very popular with Filipino crews. They um, they 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 tend not to go to the gym, but they prefer. They always insist on having a basketball. Um, uh, ring in, in the on the deck and and of course it was so calm and it was brilliant so I just went down there was about four or five of them playing basketball so it just felt really kind of strange and incongruous in a way yeah okay a couple of questions are coming through uh, yep. Ian so maybe we can uh, address them as you go through any uh, remaining yep. images if that's okay with you Alan yeah. Kelly asks, uh, what reaction did you get from your fellow rig workers to you having your gear and making photos on the rig? Was one. Yeah, they they were um, yeah, very, very friendly, very uh, comfortable, actually welcomed it, which was great because again, you know, cameras, um, digital cameras were, were banned, phones were were banned, particularly when you go out onto the onto the drill floor. So uh, so it was great for them. And I, of course, I knew them. I was working there um, and they were very comfortable with it. Yeah. OK. So there's a question through from a student at City of Glasgow College, Kazama. She says it's a bit worrying to hear that you were struggling to get your projects off the ground and being disillusioned. Do you think it was due to the subject matter or the people you were approaching at the time just didn't understand how powerful a photography project can be for them. I mean, I wouldn't say that. I mean, I, I was less disillusioned about not being able to um, to work on the projects. I guess for me, it was not having the time to develop them. So in a way, it was more the fact that what I was doing sort of commercially um, I wasn't getting excited about it anymore. And as a result of that, I was having to just spend a lot of time um, sort of in front of the computer, not enough time sort of shooting. So, and that is, I, I think, you know, that happens. And I think that, um, I think the important thing is, is that you find a way within the industry to try and kind of keep things sort of working for you. You know, you've got to keep kind of positive. I think if there's areas of your work that you're not comfortable with, move i mean try something else and and, and i kind of like I, I sort of sometimes think about the industry as a kind of tree that's got all these kind of different branches and you can move from one area to another and it's always just about sort of maneuvering yourself over time throughout the the industry in order to try and find the opportunity to do projects and actually really commit to developing them so and that's where i feel that like i am just just now um is that I feel like I've got a much better kind of balance because I know that my projects take time. It's not a day here or there. It tends to be sort of quite a bit of time away. And in a way, I try and use my photography as a means to access environments that would never otherwise get the opportunity to access. So that's kind of how I, I, you know, that's what I get a kick out of and that's what I enjoy. Yeah, there was a question about what advice would you give for those about to enter the enter the world of photography 
you've partly answered that in what you've just said. Is there anything else you would add to that I mean, broad question? Yeah, no, I mean, I would say that, and I say this to, to students as well. I mean, I, I think that, um, you know, for me, when I, I, after I graduated, yeah, I mean, of course, the, 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 everyone wants to, to, to get funding of £20,000 to go and indulge in a project, but the reality is it's just not going to happen. So, but look at every part of it as a means to sort of um, develop your, your, your skill set. And, and, and that's really exciting. So from the first jobs and um, commissions that I got after I, I, I left uh, uni, that was so super exciting for me. And then that just kind of extended to, to doing other work and, um, and uh, so I would just, I mean, the most important thing is to get your folio together at the end of college or university and contact people, whether it's other photographers that are there so you can get experience assisting or contacting design agencies or, you know, um, other organizations. It's really important and just enjoy the journey, I think. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think we'll pick up um, on a couple of other questions at the end, uh, Ian, after uh, Alicia has spoken and answered the questions to her. So thank you very much, Ian, and we'll now swap over uh, to Alicia, if that is, uh, is okay. If you'd like to unshare your screen. Yeah, sure. Thank you. So um, we'd like to introduce uh, Alicia Farnan now. So uh, I think the first time I met you, Alicia, was at uh, Northeast Photography Network uh, Baltic Book Fair. And, uh, Long time ago, yeah. Yeah, 20, 2014 in actual fact, but we'll come back to that. So you did an undergrad course at Napier yep. and then you did your degree course at Glasgow School of Art. You graduated in 2015, is that correct? Yep. yep. Uh, last year, uh, beginning of last year, we, you were one of the winners in the Jill Todd Photographic Award with your series uh, Social State that we'll hear about very shortly. Some of that work was also shown at AF Gallery in Berlin in an exchange project that we did uh, between Glasgow uh, and Berlin at the time. And you exhibited alongside two other Glasgow-based uh, artists, Elisa Stack and uh, Declan Finn Malone, and the name of that project was Photographic Parallels. You undertook a residency in later 2019 in Ukraine, which was uh, supported by the British Council. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that is where your project, Organised Recreation, began. Yep, that's, yep. Yep, so... Do you want to tell us about your practice and what's led you to uh, organise recreation? Yeah, sure. Um, I'll just share my screen with you so you can see. So my practice focuses a lot on social architecture. Um, for the past eight or so years, I've been working on um, Social State, which is the project that Malcolm just mentioned. It looks at social clubs, ex-servicemen's clubs, um, minors' welfares and bowling clubs, predominantly in the west of Scotland. Um, and it looks at kind of like the history and legacy of the buildings, because a lot of them are currently underfunded they don't have enough of a membership to keep going so a lot of them are closing their doors so it's kind of like a like a living archive of these spaces um so that's that's a project that i've been working on for quite a while um and I, again like it's looking at the social architecture and that is a general theme in the work and that is what i um showed in Berlin. This is a, an install shop from Berlin. Um, I showed quite a few pieces there and I continued and then expanded that when I was in the Jill Todd show in street level, um, which was a great opportunity to show the work as quite a big chunk of the project because the project itself, because it's been going on for eight years already, there's a lot of images. Um, and a lot of them you don't get to see the light of day, to be honest, because there's so many. So it was nice to have an opportunity to kind of share a big chunk of that. Yeah, is that um, going to be ongoing, that project, Social State? Yeah, I'm, I'm planning on continuing it just as 
as long as I can because there's so many social clubs um, and I really think they're fundamentally important to um, kind of like everyday life, do you know? They're like really the heart of a lot of communities. They have been fundamental to um, like the minor strikes in the 80s. They are a good source for socialising for people who are older. Like there's just, there's such a wealth of culture and history in these buildings. So I think it's quite important for me to keep continuing. And also I really like these spaces. So at any opportunity for me to go and have a nosy, that's fine with me. So <laughs> I'll be continuing with that as much as I can, yeah. yeah. There was a good interview with you in, uh, on Document Scotland's website that Sophie Gerrard mm -hmm. undertook with you. I'd recommend people uh, go and look at that. I read that. Uh, similarly with the photo filmic interview with uh, with Ian, but um, yeah, there's a there's a bit of a kind of social uh, social geography mapping going going on here of these places that are mm -hmm. kind of disappearing. They're kind of emblems of um, a kind of former uh, industrial selves, aren't they? It's it's very interesting. Yeah, that is what I'm interested in. I'm quite interested in not necessarily nostalgia, but like a lot of places that do hold like a richness of history and a richness of, that they say a lot about the environment that they're in and about the time that they were popular. Um, yeah, so yeah, I guess it is, it's kind of like a living archive of these spaces um, that are kind of across genre, but it's always looking at social architecture. Um, like last year, I started a project called What I Think When I Think About the Sea. Um, and that's looking at sea, traditional seaside towns um, in the UK. So the first one I went to was Blackpool, which is where this image is from. Because um, I'd never been to Blackpool before. All my friends when I was younger went to Blackpool on their holidays and I never went. So I had this kind of like idea in my head of what Blackpool would be like. Um, so I thought I would go and see for myself. So that's another project that I'd like to continue. Um, I was hoping that I'd be able to do some more of it this year, but because of the residency that I was doing at the beginning of the year um, and because of everything that's going on, it's kind of on the back burner, but it's another project that I'm hoping will have longevity. Because I kind of see all of the projects that I'm working on as one and one and the same, really, because they all look at similar topics. They're just different aspects of similar topics. Um, so they're kind of, they are broken up with different names and shown separately sometimes, but they're all interchangeable because they're all looking at, at similar things. Um, so that's kind of what led me to doing similar work in Ukraine when I was over there. Yeah, OK. Well, you want to tell us a bit about the residency mm -hmm. and uh, show us some images about what you, what you did there? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the residency that I did was part of the UK-Ukraine swap programme through the British Council, um, which is a cultural exchange similar to Photographic Parallels, actually, um, where there was quite a few artists that came from Ukraine over to Scotland. Um, and then there was quite a few artists from the UK, all over the UK, that then went over to Ukraine in different places. Um, I was placed in a city called Dnipro, um, which is... It has a lot of ties to aerospace and industry. Um, it was a closed city to the public until the 90s um, because it was quite heavily involved in the Soviet space race. Um, so it's, it's still got quite a lot of really gorgeous Soviet architecture and there's quite a lot of culture that comes with that. Um, it's also quite close to the Donetsk and Donbass region, which is the region that is currently in conflict with Russia. So there's a lot of people who have come from those regions that border Ukraine and Russia into Dnipro um, to live because their, their area is in turmoil. So that's where I was based. Um, so then when I was when I went there, I was thinking about, you know, what what how can I translate the work that I make? What are my interests? My interests are social architecture. So I kind of looked basically at social clubs, the Ukrainian version of social clubs, which are generally um, called palaces of culture. So during the Soviet era, um, organized religion was banned 
Um, so a lot of uh, religious buildings were repurposed and then there was also buildings that were built specifically as an alternative to organised religion where people could come and do recreational activities together um, and that's how we ended up with Palaces of Culture. So this first image here is specific to that industry that I was talking about. So this is the Palace of Culture from Mechanical Engineers. So the images that are on the wall are all aerospace based. Um, and this one actually was the most like a Scottish social club. There was a room full of um, pool tables and there was men playing pool in the middle of the afternoon, which was really nice. It felt quite homely to me because it's where I'm used to going. Um, the only difference was that they didn't have a bar and they were all drinking cups of tea. So that was a wee bit different from the UK, but it was a really great space. Um, so that's that's what I was looking at when I was over there. Um, I, was, I wasn't specifically looking at palaces of culture, but that was kind of the main focus because there's a lot of those spaces. But I was just looking at different types of social architecture, be it this is um, the aquarium for freshwater fish. Um, so I was looking at that because it's another type of social space. And then this is a social space in a hotel that I was staying at in Nipro. Um, so I'm looking at kind of like a, a, a melding of like different types of social spaces in different um, locations for different reasons, um, all under the name of organised recreation. Um, again, with like the rest of my bodies of work, I'm looking to continue and expand it, looking to go to different countries um, in Europe to have a look at their social spaces and see if they have similarities and what those similarities are and what the differences are. Um, the kind of the main reason behind me looking at these spaces actually was because of the back backlog of information that I have on social spaces in Scotland and the UK. When I was in Ukraine, it was during the time when we were supposed to leave the European Union. So I was thinking a lot about cultural identity, what it means to be in Europe. Do I feel like I have, you know, like a, a link to Europe? Am I European? What do we share? What do we not share with the kind of rise of isolationism? I thought it was quite interesting to look at spaces that are for everybody and what what similarities can we share? Um, so that's kind of why, why I turned my lens to similar things over there as well. Um, yeah, that's what I was looking at. Yeah. So that uh, that could uh, develop into a, a much longer term project, that, couldn't it? Yeah. At this time of great change uh, mm -hmm. in relation to Europe, but also in the current uh, current circumstances that we'll maybe come back to mm -hmm. very shortly in relation to social state and what I think. But you did an exhibition also in Ukraine, did you? Yeah. Um... It was a group exhibition with everybody that was involved in the residency programme. Um, and it was split across two venues in Nipro, the city that I was based in. So it was based in Art Suite Gallery, which is the contemporary art gallery in the city. And it was also split over the Nipro Centre for Contemporary Culture, which is a, a building and project that is currently being developed um, for that city so that they can have one kind of big hub of a space for people to look at all kinds of contemporary culture. Um, so for that, I decided to play around with the scale of my images because usually I work at around about A3 and I was always a bit a bit anxious about making the work bigger. Um, but for this show, I thought I would give it a try doing it larger than life and making the scale of it, the size of the wall. Um, and I, I actually really enjoyed it. It was quite surreal. Um, surreal to have these spaces larger than life. It was almost like you could kind of step into them. But these spaces are also interesting. So I think it's good to give people an opportunity to look at it really closely um, and to be able to see all of the little bits and bobs in the scene. Because um, there was even bits in these photos when I blew them up that I didn't even notice when I was editing. So it was quite an interesting change in the way that I could see my work. Yeah. And what was the experience like of working working there? Did it feel that you were in a very different place or with different people? Or was it all quite comfortable and a uh, lot of synergies going on? It was a bit of both, actually. In the beginning, it took me a bit of getting used to um, 
yeah, it took, it took me a bit of acclimatising. Um, but once I got into a rhythm of doing it and I felt more comfortable um, going into these spaces, it was exactly the same as it was here. So I was using a lot of Google Translate and speaking into my phone and it would translate it and then the person would speak back to me. And like, I remember having a conversation with a, a man who worked in one of the palaces of culture and he was like, but why, why are you interested in these? What's interesting about these buildings? And I was like, well, what's not interesting about them? They're great. And he kind of looked at me and I was like, yeah, I mean, I guess everybody's got different interests, don't they? Like, and he was like, right, okay. Yeah. So it, it was very similar to how it, how it is here, where I'll go into a social club and the guys that are sitting at the bar will be like, what do you want to take pictures in here for? And I'm like, why not? Look at it, it's great. So it's, it's all one and the same, really. <laughs> And how were you received uh, as a as a citizen? Were you uh, was it any different uh, in terms of you being Scottish, or were you considered to be from the UK? Um, mostly from the UK. Yeah, um, I did. I don't really know that I had massive discussions with people about where I'm from, um, but when I did. Actually, I had a conversation with a guy in a taxi once and he was saying that he loves the sound of the bagpipes. And I was like, are you sure though? Because the, bag, the bagpipes sound rotten. But it was, it was quite interesting because I think people, I think people in Scotland are really, you know, proud of where we come from and they really think we make a mark on the world. But then you kind of step out of Scotland and you speak to people and they're like, oh yeah, Scotland, that's in England. And then it becomes this kind of like discussion about, I don't know, like kind of, identity um which I think is quite interesting but I think for the most I was just seen as someone who wasn't Ukrainian but it was fine <laughs> but that's an interesting prospect of you undertaking similar projects in other mm -hmm. places and other countries mm -hmm. uh, extending that mapping process that you're doing because mm -hmm. in that respect you'd certainly find Latvia and Lithuania of, of, of great interest obviously mm -hmm. again yeah. former soviet mm -hmm. uh, soviet states mm -hmm. yeah uh, it's really high up on my list yeah and do you have a lot more images here uh, alicia to show um i don't think so i think that's yep that's the last one so i think um i can go back and show some more of the the organized recreation ones but that's that's it for me that's that's good <laughs> And uh, the publication, mm -hmm. uh, the field notes, uh, how did that come about? It was quite serendipitous actually, because Ian, who runs um, Another Place Press, I really admire his work um, as a photographer. He's got a really amazing project called, called Out of the Ordinary. Um, and I really like the, the work that he does with Another Place Press, because the books are always just gorgeous. Um, so I was just about to email him to ask if he would be interested in looking at my project and he beat me to it. So he emailed me first and asked uh, if I would be interested in working in the Field Notes project, which is this new affordable photozine project where um, he's publishing bodies of work that look at like place. Um, so it was, it was pretty perfect actually. Yeah, yeah. No, it's important that people do that, facilitators do that they create platforms uh, to share the work of others mm -hmm. in that respect you also co-founded the platform peach estate could you tell mm -hmm. us a little about that please yeah i founded peach estate in 2016 with jenny lintome who's also a photographer who i studied with when i was at gsa um because we were quite interested in democratization of photography because a lot of platforms when you share your work a lot of them ask for a fee um, so we were interested in sharing work that we were interested in and passionate about for no cost so we run a platform on Instagram where we share work from all over the world and it's inspiring for us to be able to look at all of these artists who are making work but it's also inspiring for other people to be able to see the work so it's it's quite a it's quite a nice project and a really really enjoy running it yeah good good well i hope that that continues and i hope that we do see that uh, manifest itself mm -hmm. in some kind of exhibition or publication form 
hopefully that would be that would be great yeah i think that's what? kind of our ultimate goal yeah could i just go back to a uh, social state for a moment mm -hmm. um, just in terms of your own kind of personal investment in that very mm -hmm. much your uh, your background is steeped uh, in the places that these venues might be might be mm -hmm. housed in. But there's a your grandmother uh, is a was a historian of, of coal mining. Is yeah. that correct? Yes, yeah, she is. Um she writes books about local history uh, related to mining in Lanarkshire. Um, so I grew up going around the bins and collecting coal to send to people in Australia who've got a tie to like a bing up Hamilton. Um, so we went to social clubs when I was younger um, and I was always interested in coal, whether it was from myself or whether it was being pushed on me because she was telling me stories about miners. Um, but yeah, yeah, I've always been kind of invested in that type of history because she's so interested in it. Um, and she's got a lot of stories to tell. So it was actually her that took me out to some of the social clubs and minors' welfares in the beginning of the project because she was the one that knew where all of them were. Um, so she was a big help with that, actually. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. So bings were a part of your childhood, were they? Places yes, you would yeah. go and play. <laughs> yeah, they were. Yeah, and for those who don't know what a bing is, it's a collected mass, big, huge heap of shale that's uh, dug out the ground when uh, coal mining is undertaken. Interesting connection in terms of fossil fuels between mm -hmm. your coal <laughs> and indeed uh, in the Eanes here. Mm -hmm. So um, I'll just see if there's any questions coming through for you here, uh, Alicia. Not quite yet, but the other project I uh, wanted to return to is what I think when I think about the sea. Mm -hmm. That um, That's the photographs of, of vacant and abandoned, otherwise holiday resorts, seaside mm -hmm. towns. And we've, we've got a lot of them in Scotland, you know, places, yeah. the, the fading grandeur of, uh, of, these, of these towns, which I have to say, are kind of bouncing back, mm -hmm. uh, hit slightly from the side in the current lockdown situation. I have to see, have to say, but I just wonder if you had any thoughts on whether the current situation, when we return to some kind of equilibrium and normality, that the tourism might become inversed in a way and that people might take more advantage of of the local mm -hmm. i'm hoping so i mean these places have so much to offer but they've been under visited and underfunded for a long time so you can tell when you go to these spaces that maybe like 40 50 years ago do you know they were the place to go that people would go on coach trips and go for a day down or go for a weekend um like in 2015 I was doing a an internship in Rothsey um which was one of the most popular tourist destinations in Scotland and you used to be able to get the Waverley paddle steamer down the water to go to Rothsey um mm -hmm. and Rothsey as a Scottish example, it has so much history. It's got Mount Stuart Trust, which is a gorgeous, gorgeous building. And it's also got the Rossi Pavilion as well, um, which has hosted loads of different things all over the years. I think they had a gig, I want to say they had a gig with Mogwai at one point as well, where they got people in on the ferry um, and people did like a night on the island. Um, so that there's just, I would like to think that people will start to have a look closer to home because there are so many amazing places that you can visit quite easily. Um, well, Rossi Pavilion is under development at the moment. It is, yeah. Mm -hmm. Slightly set back with the coronavirus situation. Hopefully building works will resume quite soon. Yeah, and uh, Rossi Pavilion will become again the the centre of that town in the same way that Dunoonborough Hall mm -hmm. uh, is uh, and, and Dunoon obviously and mm -hmm. the Rockfield Centre in Oban mm -hmm. will be opening uh, early end of this year early next year so mm -hmm. that's what I mean these these towns are are kind of um, 
getting back up on their feet with culture being at the center of them. Definitely. It's really interesting. There's three bodies of work there, Alicia, that you could continue with for quite some time. And in actual fact, I couldn't really see necessarily any end point for any of them. No, me either, to be honest. And I'm quite happy with that because the more places that I get to go to, the more inspired I am to make more work because everyone has a kind of similarity to the the decor and the people, but they're all so different at the same time. So I get really excited to go to these places. Um, and I just wish everybody else was so excited about them because I think they're great. Yeah, yeah. So you recently um, gave up your, your job uh, to devote yourself more full time to, to photography. Mm -hmm. Um, how are you finding that? In, in other words, um, how do you pay the bills? <laughs> um, it was quite daunting, actually. Um, I was working I've, since I graduated in 2015. Photography's kind of been on the back burner, which I think it's the same for a lot of graduates because it is hard to kind of get your foot in the door to make work, and it's hard to keep a steady income. Um, so a lot of people who are really passionate about their work find that they don't have the time to make it. And that was me as well. So I was working full time and I was kind of doing it in spurts when I could, doing it here and there. Um, and then I started, I actually read a book um, that was really interesting. Um, it was called Where Is That Light Now? Which is about um, a guy who is a photographer who um, also went through the same thing where he was struggling working full time and he wasn't able to make the work that he wanted to make. And he was like, I'm a still a photographer. Do you know if I'm not making the work, I'm a still a photographer. And then it was like one of those things where I was like, I'm a still a photographer if I'm not making work, do you know? Like what constitutes being a photographer? Do you have to do it 24 seven or can you do it when you want? And I do think that there is, I don't know, like there is room for everybody to do it in different ways that they want to. But I think at that point, I was just like, right, okay, no, this is actually what I want to do. So I was really lucky that um, once I finished up at the job that I was at, I went straight to Ukraine, pretty much, um, which was quite a rare opportunity and that it was funded. So I was funded to go to Ukraine, funded to stay there. And then the exhibition opportunity was also funded. I think a lot of opportunities that are out there are, you know, self-funded, yeah. um, which makes them quite inaccessible and um, definitely skews the demographic of people who can afford to do it. Um, but the I can't fault the SWAP programme with British Council. Um, it was great. So anybody who's looking to do that sort of thing, once things get back to normal, really recommend it because it was a great way of not only giving me like a kind of boost of confidence in my work but it was also a really good opportunity to do something that I would never have been able to do because I was over there for five weeks and I would never be able to afford to go somewhere for five weeks just off my own back um, and yeah. yeah so it was great. Yeah well, good on you for doing that. There's a question in uh, with regards to social state when it was shown in Berlin mm -hmm. the question being how well did a Berlin audience relate to social state, which is maybe quite a difficult one to answer. I want to try and rephrase that. Did it feel um, different putting this work, which was based in Glasgow and Lanarkshire, in such a huge urban uh, city uh, as Berlin? Do you have any observations on that? Mm -hmm. It was actually not as daunting as I thought it was going to be because I think there's a and I don't know if this is the correct word but like a universality kind of thing where it, it's like a person from any part of the world can recognize somewhere where other people spend their time do you know like in Berlin they might not necessarily have a working men's club but they'll have some kind of equivalent of that just like when I went to Ukraine and they had the, the uh, palaces of culture there's always some kind of architectural link because there's always going to have to be places for people to socialize and people to get involved in recreational activities so it was quite nice to have a chat with people who came to the opening about their own experiences of the equivalent of that in in Germany um, yeah. Yeah. So I think it went down okay actually yeah 
It, it does, uh, as relevant to the topic of, of what the exchanges uh, were about, the exchange exhibitions, which was photographic parallels, and it mm -hmm. was looking at Glasgow and Berlin as former great industrial cities and mm -hmm. their not so much their industrial pasts, but just speculating on their industrial futures. So there were a couple of um, exchange residencies that were undertaken as well. I just mentioned this for the audience, Alicia. I know mm -hmm. that you know this very well. Doro Zinn, who uh, came from Berlin to Glasgow and undertook a residency focused on the Goggles area. And Robert Henderson uh, spent a month uh, in Berlin. So that's just a little uh, plug for, uh, for those two projects. I think at this point, we may ask uh, Ian to, to come back in and uh, see whether there's any other questions generally coming in. Is that okay with you, Alicia? Mm -hmm. Yeah. No problem. Yeah, you have someone from uh, Ukraine uh, sitting in on this, uh, Ilya. Zabalitny. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. the director of the Swap UK Ukraine. Yeah. She, says, she <laughs> says greetings. Thank you very much, uh, Ilya, for, for joining us uh, today. So, uh, Ian, Alicia, um, well, not many more questions coming in at the moment, but let's. Uh, how have you found uh, the lockdown uh, experience uh, as it relates to, to your own practice? Shall I go first? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, it's been, fortunately for me, it's been really quite busy, to be honest, because I've, I've spent most of my time occupied with, um, with teaching. So, um, so a lot of a lot of Zoom calls, um, a lot of supporting sort of students with their projects. So not too much time in terms of working on, on my own um, photography, keeping my, my eye in here and there where I can to just, um, you know, I've been doing a little bit of sort of shooting just down, down at the River Kelvin, just, um, you know, bumping into people and uh, asking if they wouldn't mind me taking their portrait and that sort of thing. So, um, but Bumping into people at a social distance, obviously. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah, not literally bumping into people. <laughs> yeah. But has it given you more time to think about your, your particular practice, uh, respectively, you, you as well, Alicia? Yeah, it has. Um, at the beginning of the COVID outbreak, I was in Ukraine for my exhibition um, and the borders began to close. So we all had to leave really rapidly within the space of about 24 hours from when it was announced. Um, and then when I got back, I did have a lot of new work that I'd made when I was over there, but I also kind of was sitting thinking about how strange it is that for a while, I'm not gonna be able to really make any work because I can't access any of the spaces that I go to. Um, and what does that mean? Do you know, like I've always kind of thought of the work that I'm making as a kind of archive for the future, but it kind of felt a bit ominous that that was already happening like right now. Do you know, like I can't get into any of these places because they currently, currently no one's able to get into them. So it was a bit of a, it was a bit of a strange kind of existential experience at the beginning of lockdown, actually. Um, but I was quite lucky that I've had the time to go through my archives. So it's been good for me to spend time looking at what I do have and looking at images that maybe I overlooked um, yeah. going in for re-edits. Okay. And is there any uh, other photographers or artists' works that you have... Uh respectively been looking at during this time that you may not have uh, encountered before? Yeah, I mean, I, I sort of love collecting photo books. So that's that's kind of continued, which has been been really good. Um, uh, I've got, a, a, I've actually pulled a, a couple of books here. Um, I've been, uh, Jean Kachun, The Yellow River, which was a, which was a book that uh, I missed out on getting when I think the second edition had been published a, uh, a couple of years ago. And um, I mean, it's just beautiful. I mean, the landscape photography is just 
you know, off the charts. It's fantastic. Really, really interesting. So a combination really of um, quite a variety, not necessarily that influences my sort of practice directly, but just kind of nourishing in terms of looking at, um, you know, different, different work across the spectrum, really. Okay. Anything on your front, uh, Alicia? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I have been kind of returning to old favourites whilst also looking at new ones. So the photo book that I've got in lockdown was Stephen Shore's Transparencies. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's a bunch of work that was made 1971 to 1979. So not particularly new, but also still completely relevant. Um, mm -hmm. And I've been following his Instagram because he updates regularly with photos made for Instagram. Um, but I've also been looking, using Instagram as a platform to find people who I'm interested in. There's two photographers from London in particular that I really like, and their Instagram usernames are um, nothingmate1990 and virtual sync, and they both do a lot of still life, um, still life and kind of like social documentation, looking at architecture, mostly outside, and their work is just really nice. Um, so yeah, that's two people that I've been looking at. Yeah, that's two excellent choices from the both of you. If I could just ask uh, Ian and Alicia that after this, if you don't mind going on to Facebook, uh, there's uh, some comments from people who've joined the joined this talk today. There's a couple of uh, little questions there for you, if you wouldn't mind kind of answering them. There's one for you. Uh, Ian and one for you, Alicia as well, one from Donna and one from Robin Mitchell. Mm -hmm. So if you have a look and uh, maybe you can quickly respond to them. But I think we'll probably uh, bring it to a close. Um, is there any projects or news you'd like to share at this point with the audience? I mean, I was, uh, depending on how things sort of develop with the easing of the lockdown. I mean, I'm, I am hopeful of, very hopeful um, or overly optimistic about, um, uh, you know, getting back out to, to the North Sea. I had I had planned to, to spend a bit of the summer out there. So I'm, I'm still hoping there might be an opportunity to do that. Um, I've been working on a project with the RAF for a couple of years down at RAF Marham in Norfolk. So that's quite interesting. And that sort of developed on the back of the Starlings on Fire work that um, that I I did um, uh, also on, on, on the oil rig. So um, I'm coming to the end of that. So I'm hoping I'm going to get the opportunity to go down and, and um, finish that. So, um, so it's quite exciting. So I'm looking forward to, to, to cracking on with stuff again. Yeah. And what about you, Alicia? What, where are you going to make a beeline for when you're <laughs> set free from isolation? Um, my immediate plans for photography is to look at the New Towns. Um, so the New Towns project was um, from the government. Um, it was regeneration after the war when there was a an un, like an under un, the. The housing market was underdeveloped, so in Scotland they made six or seven new towns, um, including East Kilbrides and Urban. Um, so I'm looking at going there um, to kind of look at the legacy of those places and to see if there's any lessons that we can learn, because it's been quite a long time since we're built. I think it's 100 years in 2021. Um, 70 years, sorry, 70 years in 2021. Um, so I'm wanting to go there because it's more of a kind of local look. Um, and I think there's quite a lot that I can learn and quite a lot that maybe we can learn um, because we're currently in a housing deficit again. Um, so that's that's what my plans are. Yeah. Well, I think that will certainly add yet another dimension uh, to your practice. Hopefully. So just to remind everyone, um, the publications, are available from Another Place Press. I don't know if we can get the website address up on the Facebook. We'll, we'll post it there uh, where you can order the books, if indeed there are any left, because I do believe that in the period of lockdown, uh, orders have come in uh, quick and fast, an actual fact for both of them. So um, if you're fast enough, folks, you might still be able to get one of them. Uh, you mentioned Dean Sargent, photographer who runs Another Place Press. So 
that imprint field notes is open to applications. So um, if you go onto the website, you'll find the address to which you can you can write and uh, submit your work for potential publication. So I think on that note, we'll uh, we'll bring we'll bring this to a close. I can only thank you so much, uh, Alicia and Ian, for your time today. I know a lot goes into this. We haven't had time to talk about the art on your walls. Maybe we'll come back to that <laughs> another time, but we've had time to have a little look while uh, <laughs> listening to your fascinating uh, presentations. So thanks to everyone. Just to remind you while you're here that the next uh, close-up talk will be next Tuesday, and that will be uh, a Peter Shah uh, in conversation with uh, Sakai Mishashi. So tune in to that next Tuesday at 6 p.m. Thanks again to everyone for joining and uh, see you all soon. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Thank you.